What's up? What's up? You're hanging with the Niners nut. Uh, coming back at you just a couple days after the uh, 2023 NFL draft. And uh, it was uh, very interesting uh, to watch. Of course, you know, the Niners didn't have themselves uh, a first or a second round draft pick, which was really disappointing and really surprising because I think there are a lot of players out there that they really could have benefited from having. Um, but that being said, it is what it is. And, uh, they made the moves that they had to make in order to, uh, you know, in order to get the players they needed to get. So it is what it is at this point. But, um, so this episode, what we're doing is just reviewing the 49ers off season moves. And we're just going to go into the NFL draft with that. Uh, it's been an interesting off season to say the most. We all know, um, you know, the issues that they 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 had with them with the salary cap and whatnot. And, uh, you know, it, it was a lot to uh, to take into consideration. It's never easy, obviously, if you're uh, John Lynch or uh, Shani, because they had to uh, make, you know, they had to do a lot of things that probably they didn't want to do and lose a lot of guys that they didn't want to lose. At the same time, you got to make room for new blood, man. So it is what it is. But, uh Looking at that right now, uh, obviously just going through, you know, the um, going through the the going through the the list of free agents who was resigned, of course, you know, real quick, Colton McKibbitts was resigned to a two year deal to Sean Gibson was resigned to a one year deal. For those of you that remember and don't remember to Sean Gibson had himself a career year last year. So it was a really good idea to bring him back. They re-signed long snapper Tabor Pepper. They re-signed wide receiver Juwan Jennings. Again, another good move because what I really like about these guys that they're re-signing, preferably McKivitz, Gibson, Pepper Jennings, Givens, Brendel, Flanagan Fowles, McGill, Dwelling, and Hyder, is that they've been on the team before. And I always feel that when you have guys who know the system in which they're playing, whether it be offensive or defensive, there's something important to that. There's something to be said for that. And a lot of these players they brought back obviously have history with the 49ers and have played for them in the past. So again, McKivitz, Gibson, Pepper, Juwan Jennings, Kevin Givens, Jake Brendel, Demetrius Flanagan Fowles, T.Y. McGill, Ross Dwelly, Kerry Hyder. They also re-signed Willie Sneed in the last couple of days. So again, you know, solidifying positions and just adding more depth to the positions in which they needed depth in. Um, obviously, you know, out of these free agents, in my opinion, Colton McKivitz was obviously one of the most important because we've seen McKivitz fill in admirably in the absence of other players because of injury and he held his own. So that was always a great thing to Sean Gibson that I just mentioned career year. Juwan Jennings, in my opinion, is just a phenomenal third option as a wide receiver. He's tall. He catches a lot of big time game balls, uh, you can't have enough wide receivers in this league. It's sort of like running backs and quarterbacks, in my opinion. You just can't have enough because you never know when one's going to go down and you never know when, you know, another one's going to have to step up. Kevin Givens, I mean, didn't play bad. He's a solid defensive tackle. And again, it's good to fill in a guy who has the experience of playing for the 49ers before uh, and bringing him back. Jake Brendel, again, probably one of the most important pieces of that offensive line, had a phenomenal year last year. They signed him to a four-year deal. Another piece solidified to an experienced offensive line. I love Jake Brendel. Demetrius Flanagan Fowles, I love too. Guy hustles whether he's on special teams or whether he fills in the game. Now, of course, he may not get as much burn because of Oren Burks uh, being the other starter now that we lost um, uh, Azir. But it's good to have him, I think, because he has experience. T.Y. McGill, again, another good run stuffer. I have no problem with him resigning. Ross Dwelly, again, good backup tight end, knows the system really well. And Kerry Hyder, you know, uh, you know, yeah, obviously, what? What has it been now? Not last year, not yet. Three years ago, he had a career year, but he had either eight and a half or nine and a half sacks. Then he went to Seattle, didn't do much, came back last year. Kind of had a so-so year. But again, I, I like Kerry Hyder, man. He knows, the, he knows the situation. He knows the defense. So, you know, I, I like all the moves they made. Um, and again, uh, with the, the recent move of signing Willie Sneed, look, again, a veteran. Willie Sneed had his day, man. He was a, a good fastball receiver, very quick. Uh, put up some decent numbers uh, with some certain teams. 
but uh, was with the Saints and then with the Ravens, of course. But it's always good to have a veteran, I think, amongst these these other these wide receivers because again, you never know when one's going to go down. Golf a bit. So again, another thing they did was save a lot of money by resigning a lot of these players because of the situation with their salary cap, which we all know. Was it was a very rough thing. I mean, me personally, I didn't dig a lot of the signings that they made in the free agent area. Uh, I'm sorry, I didn't dig a lot of the players they let go. I should say, and now moving on to that, because I just felt that there was some some guys that um, I don't know. You, you all know how I felt about Sam Darnell. If you didn't, you know, you could look on my page and you can see my reaction. I'm still really shocked about that one year, four point five million dollars. For a bust. Sam Darnell is a career bust. I'm sorry to say that, but that's what he is. Or I should say he's a mediocre quarterback at best. But if they want to sign him as a backup, hey, I I don't really agree with it. They recently just signed yesterday Brandon Allen, who was a backup in Cincinnati to Joe Burrow. And if you look at his numbers, they're serviceable numbers for a backup. And I have no problem with having multiple quarterbacks um, going into going into the you know going into camp, I think the more competition they have back there, the better. I personally would have liked to see them draft a quarterback in this past NFL draft. I thought there were a lot of players still out there when they were drafting, um, but that's just me. Uh, one guy that comes to mind who I don't think they would have been able to get at all was uh, Stetson Bennett and Hayden Hooker. Two guys I felt that, um, I don't know, there was something about them that I liked. There was their experience. There was their playing ability. There was their lengthy college career that I kind of liked, but that didn't happen. So we go on from there. So who did we sign? Obviously, we made a big splash with Javon Hargrove, four years, $80 million, a phenomenal move. Uh, obviously, now uh, it, it, it looks like even a more phenomenal move now that we know the Niners are not going to pick up the fifth year for Javon Kinlo, which we can pretty much understand because, look, to be fair, I like to give a lot of guys a lot of leeway. I like to give a lot of guys um, a couple of years to develop. Look, let's talk. Let's talk straight. Javon, uh, I'm sorry, uh, Javon Kinlaw. His rookie season not too bad. He had that really good game against the New Orleans Saints. I think he had a sack and a half or two sacks. Then uh, he had a washout season where he had the injury, hardly played. Then last year he was supposed to be coming back. Hardly saw him. Uh, so what did they do? They go out and they signed Javon Hargrove. Hargrave, I should say, uh, who who was a stud, had a stud year with the Philadelphia Eagles, and it just adds a lot more depth to that defensive line, making them even more, you know, making them even more dangerous than they've already been. Because we all know that the 49er defense is, you know, obviously the best in football, and uh, it's a, it's a great move, man. It, it really is a great move. I mean, think of think about that 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 group we have right there, you know, um, Bosa, Armstead, Hargrave. I mean. That's pretty solid, man. Sam Darnell, you know how I feel. They could have went a thousand other ways. There were other quarterbacks they could have signed. I would have rather them have Tre- uh, a Trevor si- Seaman, Simon, to be honest, because I'm just not a Sam Darnell fan. Sam Darnell, to me, I've seen since I live on the East Coast, I've seen him play a good majority of the, uh, the games he played with the New York Jets. And I'll say the same thing that I always say about Sam Darnell when people try and show me wrong about him. He's a mediocre quarterback who starts off, either starts off really well and falters or shits the bed completely. And we saw that again last year uh, in his time with the uh, with the Panthers. OK, so you, you, you can't I don't know. You know, at this point, he's just a backup. That's it. Cleveland Farrell, one year, two point forty six million. I have my opinion about this, too. I was not happy with this. I think Cleveland Farrell, for the most part, has not been exactly a first round draft pick material. And if anyone's going to argue about this with me, you can have your own opinion. Look at the numbers, look at the stats. I know we all don't play analytics, but what has he done really to be a first round draft pick? Now, to be fair, you did get a good deal on him one year, 2.46. Hey, he's, he could turn it around and be a serviceable, def- the, the serviceable defensive end. Sure. Why not? With our defense, I mean, it's always possible. So, hey, maybe he comes in and gain, you know bulks up, changes up his body a little bit more. I hope so. Isaiah Oliver, I thought, was a pretty solid move. Two years, 6.65, adding more depth to the defensive backfield, which we always need because we know that a defensive backfield players go down, snap of a finger in this league. Uh, Miles Hartfield, another defensive backfield player, signed. John Feliciano is a move I really like, a good swing player. Played in Buffalo, pretty solid. Uh, played for the New York Giants. You know, it, I, I love these swing um offensive linemen because they're so valuable 
I always feel that, uh, that, you know, it's really important to have, especially at a position where we know injury is going to happen. Austin Bryant, no problem with that. I, you know, another, another solid defensive end. I like that. Matt Pryor comes over. He's pretty solid. Chris Conley, another wide receiver. Again, some, some really nice depth there. Chris Conley, you know, in his day, was a, was a speedster with the uh, Kansas City Chiefs. So, hey, man, who knows? Maybe he's got some gas left. Maybe we just have that more depth as a wide receiver. You know, you got him, you got Sneed, you got Juwan Jennings. Um, so it, it, it's a deep, deep group of players. They also got uh, Zane Gonzalez from the Carolina Panthers, which I think is a pretty good move because we know Robbie Gould won't be coming back, unfortunately. So, again, I think the moves they made were very strategic and very safe. They obviously didn't have the money to go out and go nuts. And, unfortunately, you know, they lost uh, a great deal of talent. But I think that they were expected to do this, being that they couldn't afford to keep these guys. So, just going through the list, my, Matt, Mike McGlinchey was never going to come back, obviously. I mean, look, there were two types of Mike McGlinchey. There was the Mike McGlinchey that played hard and got better, as we saw last season. And then there was the Mike McGlinchey that gets dogged. Uh, so, you know, again, first-round draft pick. I don't know if it's really first-round draft pick material, but I'll tell you this thing. I think they made the right move in not re-signing him. He signed a monster contract with the Broncos, and my hat off to him. I hope he does really well protecting Russell Wilson because Russell Wilson's really going to need it, especially, uh, you know, in that division. Uh, Jimmy G goes to the Raiders, of course. Good move for Jimmy G. Made a major payday. Well-deserved, well-deserved, well-deserved. I wish him nothing but luck with the Raiders. Uh, we'll see how that works. I didn't want to lose Hassan Ridgeway. I think he's one of those important pieces that good run stuffer gets in there, you know, uh, creates a lot of havoc between offensive linemen, builds up the uh, double teams, also makes it easier and better for everything, all the other players around him clogging the run. But, you know, we re -signed, we signed a couple of other players and went in another direction. Again, Hassan Ridgeway and Jimmy Ward will go on to play with head coach D'Amico Ryans in Houston. Can't blame him. Jimmy Ward, I did not want to lose at all. Such a valuable piece to the defensive backfield. You, If you're a 49er fan and you don't like Jimmy Ward or you didn't like Jimmy Ward, then you're not a 49er fan. I'm sorry, man. Manuel Mosley, another guy I really didn't want to lose. Very underrated, very talented guy. Went to the Lions, going to a good team. Uh, hopefully he does well there. Aziz Al-Shahir goes to the Titans. Look, man, he's an uber-talented guy at a position that, you know, we've got a lot of talent there. Um, I, I would have loved to have kept him. But obviously he was going to be one of those guys that was going to be odd man out because he was going to get a lot of money to go and do some damage for Tennessee. And I really hope he does. Samson Ebukabon goes to the Colts. Again, you know, he had four and a half sacks last year. I thought he was very serviceable, came up big when we needed him. But I guess to some extent he was expendable. Daniel Brunskill's a guy I didn't want to lose either to the Titans. I thought Daniel Brunskill was one of those guys that was so underrated and so valuable for the way he played uh, and just, you know, all out hard ass. Charles Amanyahu, I didn't want to lose, goes over to the Chiefs. Four and a half sacks. I thought he was very serviceable. Hope he does a lot of damage there. Maurice Hurst really wasn't a big loss because he's been injured a lot of the time that we've had him. He goes to the Browns, to various more, to the Packers, Jordan Willis, to the Raiders. So, yeah, I get. I, I think. I think though, now that the the you know the picture has been clear that a lot of the moves weren't too bad. It looks a lot worse on paper because of the the name and the large amount of money that these guys were paid. But at the same time, I think that all a lot of these guys were very valuable. Garoppolo, Ridgeway, Ward, Mosley, Shahir, Brunskill, Aminu. So you don't want to lose guys that are valuable. Uh, what about our kicker? Is he good? If you're talking about Zane Gonzalez or Moody, we shall see. Zane Gonzalez didn't have a bad season last year. Money, baby, money. Yeah, exactly. You're 100% right about that, bro. Moving on to, um, let's move on to uh, this year's past draft. Well, this year's draft, I should say, only a few days old. Uh, you know, it's funny. You could have all the experts in the world, <clears throat> Mel Kuyper, this, this guy, that guy, Mickey Mouse, Donald Duck, Goofy, Donald, Daisy, whoever the fuck considers himself to be, uh, you know, one of these experts on the draft, whatever. And you have scouts that do know their shit for the most part, or they're doing their job and breaking down the player, 
you know, uh, when they go and watch them and when they go and see them and all that stuff. And I'm not saying they're 100% wrong, but no one really knows how good these guys are going to turn out, okay? Because we all could go through a list of players that have been drafted. One who always comes to mind is Heath Schuler, Jim Drunkenmiller, um, you know, on and on and on and on and on. Kinjana Carter, you know, um, uh, Mike Williams, um, the wide receiver from the Lions. I can't think of his name. Was it Charles Johnson who broke his shoulder two years in a row? On, on and on we can go with these players. And we know that sometimes where you get drafted doesn't mean shit. Okay, because for every guy you have that was a first round pick that was supposed to be a stud, you've got someone like a Brock Purdy, you've got someone like an Eric Johnson, seventh round from Yale, you've got Tom Brady, you've got Joe Montana, you've got Steve Young, you've got all these guys that come out, Jerry Rice, Mississippi Valley State, I mean, come on. So no one really knows 100%. Do they have a good idea sometimes? Yeah, I mean, they'll break down the numbers, they'll break down the camp, they'll break down the combine. But again, no, until we see it for ourselves, until the, until it's actually on the field and getting done, no one's going to know. So I hope all these guys turn out to be studs. I really do. And I think that for the most part, it was an, inter- it, it was an interesting draft, you know, for San Francisco. Obviously, not having the, the high number of picks we'd like to have. Because of the whole Trey Lance trade, we don't have a second and first round draft pick, which I think is absolutely ridiculous. Because there was, in my opinion, there seemed to be a lot of good, solid talent of guys in the first and second round. But again, we we, we shall see. You know, time can can uh, time can show us right or wrong, especially when it comes to the NFL draft. So let's get to. Let's just go break down um, the 49ers draft uh, 2023 moves that they made. For the most part, like I said, they were interesting. I think that they were obviously trying to fill in for a lot of the uh, the positions that you know they needed. Um, I think there were a lot of moves there that was surprising. The Jake Moody move was surprising to me, at least. I, I thought that, uh, you know... I didn't think they were going to take a kicker so high. I mean, a lot of people kind of felt the same way. Who takes a kicker in the third round? But you never know. The guy could turn out to be Morton Anderson. He could turn out to be the next great thing. But still, I think there were other ways to go. That's just my opinion. But looking at, you know, let's just look at the first round. So obviously, Niners don't have a draft pick at all. There were a lot of rumors that Niners were going to trade Trey Lance to get back up early into the draft moves. I don't think that was ever going to happen. I would have educated a nice trade for him. Uh, But again, you know, there are guys that went in this round who, you know, Bryant Young, Bryce Young, CJ Stroud, Will Anderson, Anthony Richardson. We don't know what's going to turn out. You know, Anthony Richardson, go look at his college stats. Go look at how many college games he plays. And that really kind of concerns me. It reminds me of Mark Sanchez, uh, Devin Witherspoon, Tyree Wilson, Bijan Robinson I really like. I think that's a solid move for the Atlanta Falcons. Going to go play with a really good head coach who establishes himself a really good running game. Um, obviously, the Eagles did some damage getting Jalen Carter. Fucking Howie Roseman is a GM, man. I mean, this guy just doesn't stop signing big time players. I fucking hate the Eagles. Um, who else? Let's see. I think this Lucas Van Ness kid to the Green Bay Packers is going to be solid. Uh, Jets get this Will McDonald. We'll have to see what he turns out to be. Uh, Jack Campbell, I think, is going to be a player in Detroit. Uh, you know, he looks like a badass linebacker going to play for a badass coach for a team that's really on the cusp of doing some damage. A lot of good talent around him. So that was a cool move. Jackson Smith Najigba, you got to give Pete Carroll and the Seattle Seahawks credit. As much as I friggin' hate them and as much as we're going to fucking wash them when we played them, I got to say, they rebuild, restock their team so well, it's not even funny. And they get this young, good young receiver. Hopefully, he turns out to be good from Ohio State. And, he, you know, think about the pedigree of players he's going to go join. He's going to go join, you know, uh, uh, Tyler Lockett. You know, uh, I mean, they re-signed Geno Smith. Uh, going to go join Metcalf. I mean, you got to give these guys credit, man. Eagles crushed it in the draft and fucking hit. Yeah, man, it's, I fucking hate them, dude. I don't know how. I, I I can't believe they drafted. No, I can't believe Nolan Smith wasn't taken 
till such late. And only the fucking Eagles would get him. But to be fair, the Eagles did lose a lot of players in the uh, offseason, which was good to see because I still think that, again, healthy Brock Purdy, we whipped their ass, but that's just me maybe I'm biased. Um, Zay Flowers goes to the Baltimore Ravens, obviously. I mean, unless you're, you know, fucking one of the Grays who got hit on the head with a brick uh, and got hammered multiple nights in a row, you'll know that the Baltimore Ravens have needed a fucking wide receiver for so many goddamn years because Rashad Bateman and all these other guys they signed just ain't doing it. I mean, Mark Andrews needs help. He's the only wide receiver they got there. So now you gave Lamar Jackson this large amount of money. Get him a receiver. Hopefully this gentleman turns out to be good. Minnesota goes with Jordan Addison. Again, trying to add more depth They because they lost um, – what's his name over to the uh, Carolina Panthers – so, I mean, I thought that the Vikings need a lot more than a wide receiver because they're a cotton candy team whose defense is totally depleted. Giants go with Deontay Banks, a good move. Buffalo goes with a tight end. Dallas goes with a defensive tackle. No fucking, you know, we don't have to be shocked there. So, again, yeah, well, there's some good plays in the first round. I'm sure there were. Nolan Smith, as I just mentioned, I mean, he goes number 30 in the first round pick. A lot of people had him going a lot earlier, especially coming from Georgia. I would have liked to have had him. He looked really good. Uh, Joey Porter Jr. goes in the second round, just breaking it down. Will Levis was a guy I was tracking the whole time. I cannot believe that he went that late. Uh, I have a feeling he's going to turn into a stud and obviously take the job um, from Ryan Tannehill because they're not big on Malik Willis right now. And if you saw Malik Willis play last year, it wasn't that good. Hopefully he's in, he improves. But they need themselves a quarterback that can do other things than be at the one-dimensional run team with Derrick Henry because eventually that's going to stop and you're going to have to throw the ball at some point. Uh, let's see. Raiders go out and get themselves a tight end, which they needed, especially after trading Darren Waller to the New York Giants. Um, again, Seattle. They, they they get another outside linebacker. Just speaking of Seattle, they're not picking up the fifth-year option for Jordan Brooks. I cannot believe that. Go look at Jordan Brooks's numbers. If you haven't watched Jordan Brooks all season long, hell of a good uh, linebacker until he got in. Uh, I'm sorry. The other gentleman got injured. The other linebacker they had. They did not resign, by the way. Um, let's keep going down. Keep going down. Packers take themselves a tight end and Luke Musgrave. Jaden Reed, Packers take another wide receiver. Jordan Love's going to need all the help he can get because we don't know what the hell Jordan Love is. And uh, Seattle takes another running back in Zach Charbonnet. They are loaded at running back. Kenneth Walker, Zach Charbonnet. I mean, there's running back galore there. So we know that Pete Carroll really loves his running game. So, again... It would have been nice to have a pick in the second round, but that just wasn't going to happen. Um, could we have? Could there have been some solid guys that the Niners could have benefited from? Yeah, hundred percent. So they didn't make their first draft uh, move, obviously, until pick number eighty-seven in the third round, in which they picked Jair Brown, safety from Penn State. This did come from the Minnesota Vikings. Look. You know, looking at Brown, you know, looking at his college career, I mean, he had himself a, a, a really interesting college career. Um, you know, he transferred over to Penn State University in 2020. Uh, he was a backup. He took over a starter in 2021. Uh, 13 starts, 73 tackles, six interceptions, one touchdown. The six interceptions, I think, is probably the biggest stat we want to pay attention to. Uh, and he was named defensive MVP of the 223 of the 2023 Rose Bowl, which was really impressive. Five foot eleven and a half, almost six, two hundred and three pounds. So we're getting a feel for a guy who is pretty strong at five eleven, almost six feet, over two hundred and three pounds. Maybe we'll see him bulk up a little bit. Maybe not. Forty yard dash time, four point five eight. Very interesting. Um, you know, has some really interesting stats per the pre-draft. So I think this is a good move for us, obviously. Uh, you know, we know that the more help we have in um, – the more help we have in the defensive backfield, the better. I mean, obviously, he's not going to be a starter that yet, as of yet, but he's joining a really good, solid pedigree of guys. You know, uh, Talanoa Huffnig uh, should, should not – I totally messed up his name. Javarius Ward, um, Dila Dolanor, 
and obviously to Sean Gibson Jr. So he's definitely going to get some burn, without a doubt. Um, you know, uh, you know, the 49ers in defensive backfield players and safeties have a rich history. So I think this was a really good move. Always adding depth to that defensive backfield is always a good thing. Can't go wrong there. Uh, and then moving forward, of course, the Niners did not make another move until later in the third round, which was a compensation pick or a, uh, yeah, it was actually at, at 99, Jake Moody from Michigan. Now, to be fair, this shocked the living shit out of me because who takes a kicker in the third round? I don't really know many players that do, the many teams that do that. But again, you know, I, hey, look, maybe it turns out to be something good. So we all know that um, the type of year he had, he converted 22 of 24 field goals, 56 for 56 with the came to extra point. He kicked the game-winning field goal in the fourth quarter against Nebraska. He had 122 points, which led Michigan the football team. He also won the Lou Groser Award. So all these good things for his career. Um, do we need a kicker? I mean, to challenge Zane Gonzalez? Yeah, why not? Let's face it. I mean, in this league, Kicker is a very important position. No matter what anybody else says, it definitely is. I think it's just like a punter, especially with this team. We have seen what an important aspect kicker and punter have played for the 49ers. So he's going to fill, going to have to fill some big shoes, Robbie Gould. Uh, and hopefully him and Zane Gonzalez can battle it out. I can't see them keeping, you know, two kickers. I don't think that's going to happen. But this should be interesting to see these two guys go at it. So... A kicker was drafted, and then we moved down to pick 101, Cameron Latu, a pick that I think is confusing the shit out of everybody because a lot of what I read about Latu was has the size, has the skill, but just didn't perform the way they thought. From Alabama, um, obviously, you know, he's coming into a position that is crowded. Warner, Dwelly, Kittle. Uh, so... You know, six foot five, two fifty, not a bad size, pretty big guy. I mean, doesn't really look like a prototypical tight end at six foot five. You kind of think he'd have a little more bulk on him, but not really. Um, go, you know, played in a really good system in Alabama, obviously. So that's always always a, 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 a positive. Um, actually, I take that back. Six four and three eighths, two hundred and forty two pounds. These numbers sometimes they change a lot, but. Um, Let's see. He moved from linebacker to tight end before he was redshirted from the Crimson Tide. Played 11 games, used mostly on special teams in 2020. He was named the Crimson Tide starting tight end in 2021. Doesn't really seem to have outstanding numbers. Um... You know, may, again, I, I think the more depth you have, the better at this position. I could be wrong, but they're looking, obviously, for someone or someones to help take the um, the bulk of the physicality away from George Kittle because we know that, obviously, as he gets on in years – you want to keep him as healthy as possible. When he's on the field, we win. So you want to get a lot more out of your other tight ends and other tight end packages. So hopefully this works out. Again, it's a crowded position. It's a crowded area, but you never know. And let's move forward. The next pick came. It was, it, I mean, I think a lot of the good moves came in the later, the later rounds, to be honest. Um, that was just my assessment. A lot of, a lot of teams making a lot of solid moves. He's got, I'm sure a lot of these guys are going to go on to have some really good careers. Israel Abenconda from Pittsburgh with the Jets selected, I think is an interesting pick too. He's another, I thought we would have taken a running back as we always seem to do, but, um, that didn't happen. I mean, obviously that's a crowded position right now for us too, but he would have been someone I would have liked to have seen. He's got the explosive step. Daryl Luter Jr., cornerback from South Alabama, playing in the Sun Belt Division. Uh, five foot eleven and three fourths, almost six feet tall, one eighty nine. I like I like my corners to be a little on the taller side. 
You know, he's got the 4.46 40 yard dash, which I like. I so a lot of the things I heard about him were really good. I heard that he's really good at, um, you know, um, closing the gap between him and a wide receiver. He plays a physical game. He's good underneath, which is something I think you can never have enough of, especially in this league with the very dangerous wide receivers uh, who have the ability to kill you underneath. Um, yeah, there was some awesome, awesome undrafted pickup. I'm going to get to that in a second. Um, so again, he had a breakout year in 2021. Uh, let's see. Only allowing receptions on 26.7% of the passes thrown at him. Nicknamed second team All American. He recorded seven pass breakups in 2022, one interception. So it seems to me, I was also invited to the Senior Bowl. It seems to me that uh, he only, oh, look at this, he only allowed catches on 45.3% of passes. Now, all these stats I think are wonderful, but again, this is college football. Hopefully, it transcends over into the NFL, and I think for the most part, it possibly could. But those are some important stats to see from your corner because interceptions sometimes, you know, as as bright as that stat is, it's not always the thing. Sometimes the best defensive players, especially in the backfield, don't get picks. And we've seen that from a good number of famous cornerbacks and safeties in the NFL. So if we can get ourselves a guy who's a shutdown corner to some extent or makes it really hard for the quarterback to complete a pass, we need the depth back there. OK, I'll take as many corners as we can get that are good. Moving forward. That was our, one of our picks in the fifth round. It seemed like to me that our picks were so spaced out, you know. It, it seemed to me that we just didn't have a lot of picks, man. And maybe it's because the second and first round were a wash. But. Robert Beale Jr., I think this kid is going to be an experiment. There's something about him that I like. I like, first of all, he's coming from Georgia. They played in the SEC, okay? Uh, linebacker has six foot three, two forty six. So, you know, you never know. He could bulk up a little bit. Kind, you kind of use him at linebacker, kind of use him at defensive end as a rush end, kind of maybe taking over where Samson Ebocom left off. But um, if you watch the videos of this kid at the combine, man, he is a speedster. That's something I thought was really interesting. I mean, he ran a 4.48. That's fucking ridiculous for a linebacker slash defensive end. Um, let's see. Played 11 games during his freshman season at Georgia. Uh, he saw a decrease in playing time as a sophomore. Uh, let's see. He withdrew and returned to Georgia. He played in all 15 of the Bulldogs game and led the team with six and a half sacks during their national championship season in 2021. He had 26 tackles at three sacks and 20 quarterback pressures uh, as a redshirt senior. So his numbers declined in his senior year. But I think that with him in the right system being used correctly, now I'm sure that he won't, I could be wrong, he won't be, obviously, he won't be a starter. You know, he's got a lot of people in front of him, like last year's rookie Drake Jackson and then some. But I think that if they can get him in in different packages, he could turn out to be a threat. You never know, uh, especially with that speed. I mean, to have a defensive end slash linebacker with speed like that is always very valuable. So he's one of the moves I really liked. And let's move forward. Going into the sixth round. Again, a good chunk of players getting selected. Uh, team stockpiling players left and right, man. D. Winters, linebacker from TCU. You know, again, I, I think another interesting move. Um, six foot one, 230. He's going to be going into a very crowded a crowded area. I mean, Fred Warner, Oren Burks, Dre Greenlaw, um, Flanagan Fowles. Obviously, I don't think he's going to be starting. What I've heard so much is so far, is he's probably be primarily used on special teams, which is always fine. Uh, he was recruited as a safety. He was quickly changed to linebacker. Um, he appeared in 11 games, two of which he started, where he had 28 tackles and a sack. He won the starting job in his 
Sophomore year, started all 10 matches and placed second on the team with 65, 65 tackles, nine and a half, which were for losses. And then remained a starter in 2021. As a senior in 2022, he led a defense that brought TCU to the national championship game, earning first team all Big 12 honors. Okay. Um, his numbers look really good. I got to give him that. Uh, five, five, this actually says five foot 227. 40 yard dash again, 4.49 for a linebacker. That's insane. So, you know, look, I, I think these are really strategic, smart moves made by Lynch and Shanny. They know what they're looking for. And, you know, they're stockpiling players at positions where it could be a revolving door at times, or you have to plan for the future, man, and you got to plan for injury. So it never hurts, I guess, to have too many players at one position. And then moving forward from there. We entered the seventh round, which we all know from last year. Never just look at the seventh round as being the seventh round because that's where Mr. Purdy was, is Mr. Irrelevant. We know how things turn out. Braden Willis, uh, you know, this is another interesting move. I know he was used as an H back, six foot four, 239. Interesting, interesting, interesting kind of like. 6'4", 239, I mean, a little light for a tight end. Uh, could be more of a wide receiver to some extent. So could turn out to be something good. Uh, obviously played for Oklahoma. 15 passes for 177, two touchdowns as a senior. He used the extra year of eligibility due to the COVID pandemic. In his final season, he caught 39 passes for 514 and seven touchdowns. Again, some interesting numbers in terms of the pre-draft. He is 20-yard shuttle was 4.3. I don't see his 40-yard dash time here. But, uh, again, you know, I don't know how they're going to use this guy. Is he going to be a tight end? Is he going to be a wide receiver? I don't know. Either way, I think it's it's going to be – it's crowded. Could possibly see him uh, placed on um, on a practice squad you know, stockpiling him for later, which does happen. Ronnie Bell. Okay. An, an interesting move. Um, you know, I don't know if anyone's familiar out there, but Ronnie Bell apparently had this, this drop in a, in a very big game, which haunted him for many years. There was a really cool short documentary. I saw about that on Instagram, but another wide receiver. Okay. Obviously joining a very crowded position, uh, size wise, six foot one eighty four. Let's see. Uh, played one, two, three, four, five seasons for Michigan. His best season coming last year, 62 catches, 889 yards, four touchdowns. Uh, so he has a lot of experience. I like the fact that he's played um, for a while in college and played a lot of games, especially in his freshman, sophomore, and senior season. And then looking at some of his numbers, 40-yard dash time, 4.54. Like I said, it's good to have these to stockpile players, but it's it's a crowded area. I mean, Debo Samuel, Brandon Ayuk, Juwan Jennings, Ray Ray, Willie Sneed. Um, we'll see. You know, we shall see. Uh, he did catch 11 passes for 121 yards on October 8th. And he was the team's leading receiver in Michigan. So all good, interesting stats. We'll see if he can get himself a position, uh, hopefully. And then finally, the last move they made was outside linebacker Jalen Graham. Again, going defense uh, from Purdue. 6'3", 220. Again, you know, tweener for a linebacker, depending on what side of the, you know, what side, what area he's playing. Uh, 40 yard dash, 4.64, a little bit on the slow side, to be honest. 6'3, 220. Hopefully they can get that speed improved, have him bulk up a little, maybe turn him into a defensive end, rushing linebacker. I don't know. Uh, he saw immediate playing time as a freshman. In appearing in 11 games, he started eight, recorded 37 tackles and two and a half 
tackle for losses. In 2020, only played in five games. He started 13 games in 2021, 64 tackles, two picks, seven pass breakups, and a sack. He was named honorable mention all Big Ten this performance. As a senior, he only played nine games due to injury, but had 52 tackles, which was second best on the team. One interception. Um, you know, look, worse comes to worse. You red sh- you you put them on the practice squad, or you're drafting players at a position that has a lot of people in front of him. So it's going to make these guys really work their ass off to get on the field to get a position on the roster. But I think for the most point, it was um, it was a very interesting draft. I mean, they filled in a lot of places that I think were needed. I would have liked to have seen them grab another offensive lineman, but um, that didn't happen. I would have also liked to have seen them um, go after perhaps a quarterback, as I said, just to have a little bit more depth. But they did sign Brandon Allen yesterday, and I, I would have liked to have seen them maybe go for another defensive tackle, but um, that didn't happen either. So, oh, well. <laughs> but, um, again, I, I you know, knowing uh, – Knowing John Lynch and Shanahan, I'm sure that um, a lot of these guys that they selected was very strategic because, let's face it, a lot of the positions that we have on this team are already filled. Our quarterback situation is what it is already. It's in the hands of Brock Purdy, who is doing well in his recovery. Our running backs are, you know, I mean, we're loaded at running back with C-Mac and then some wide receiver, another loaded position, tight end, pretty deep position. Offensive line, I think if you look at offensive line the way it is, the key piece to this offensive line being the best as it was last year is Colton McKivitz. If he can fill in on that other side and play the way that they have faith in him, I think it's it's going to be a very dangerous offensive line because those other guys, Aaron Banks and 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 you know Burford, they're one and two years more into the process, so it's only going to help speed things up. The defense, defensive line and linebackers are all set, and defensive backfield is set too. I think, especially now with a lot more depth in that defensive backfield, so um, there wasn't anywhere that they could have drafted per position that they really needed a starter, obviously because they just didn't have that type of power in the draft, losing the first and second round with the trade for Trey Lance. And secondly, everything is pretty much solidified elsewhere. So now you're trying to just fill in depth and get some guys in there to make competition that can hopefully turn into studs. Today they did sign a uh, undrafted wide receiver. Um, Isaiah Winstead, who I posted about earlier, six foot four, uh, I think he's about two ten, has some really impressive numbers from TCU. And if you look, he's the gentleman who got himself uh, into the spotlight by using social media. So hat off to him. And if you look at some of his social media videos, kids got athletic ability and then some. I mean, I love the size, six four, two ten. It's a big boy for wide receiver. And it would be nice to have ourselves another big, big wide receiver who you can go up top to. So hopefully that works out. But again, you know, they're obviously another thing. A lot of these guys that they've drafted, they're not going to have to sign to mega lucrative contracts. You're probably going to see, you know, mid tier to a little lower type of contracts, which works out for us in a sense because of the salary cap being what it is. And it also works out for these guys who are going to have to prove themselves to be pushed forward in the upper echelon of contracts. So, again, I'm kind of happy with everything. Um, I think that we're one of the deepest teams, the ready-to-win teams right about now with the roster we have, which is pretty much very similar to the roster we've had last year. Other than injuries, I don't see any reason why – you know, Super Bowl is, 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 it's in, it's in our grasp. 
as of right now, especially with the moves we made in the offseason for Javon Hargrave, making that defense even more dangerous. So it's a win-now situation, man. And every player in place has been there for a little bit so far at starter. There's no one really more that they're adding to that position except for kicker, if it is Jake Moody or Zane Gonzalez or Colt McKivitt's a tackle that, you know, it'll be a shock to. But other than that, it's they're, they're built to win right now. So in a way, this is a good thing, too. We didn't have to do too much rebuilding. But it should be interesting to see what happens from here on out. Um, definitely keep your eyes on any more undrafted free agents that they're going to sign because it's always good to see a lot of these guys turn into studs. I think this kid, Winstead, can definitely either turn into something or definitely become a project player just from that size alone the videos I've been watching on him. Definitely check them out. But uh, I appreciate you guys uh, checking in, doing the live feed, and being part of the page. If you have any comments or you have your opinions of your own, please send them to me. I always want to hear them. And, uh, you know, good news out of, out, of, out of Santa Clara is that Brock Purdy is recovering well and be able to throw a pass soon. So that's some more good news. There's a competition in that quarterback position now. Um, you know, Trey Lance, Sam Darnell, and Brandon Allen. So, again, the more competition I think back there, the better, especially if for some reason or another Purdy's not able to go. We're going to want to see – what's going to happen there. Um, Cause I don't have any faith in Sam Darnell. That's just me. And I sure shit don't want that guy starting, but that's something we'll have to see. All right. Nine or not checking in and checking out. Be well later.